Hello, we're going to start in a minute. If you would like to view captions for this program, please look at your Zoom meeting control bar on the top or bottom of the screen and click the closed caption button. Choose either the show subtitle or view full transcript options to view captions during this presentation. Instructions for captioning are also available in the chat box. Good afternoon and welcome to our program, Family History Starts Here, using the State Library and State Archives in your research. I am Francesca Perez Evans, the Community Engagement Librarian at the State Library of North Carolina. I will be your host and moderator for this event. This presentation is a collaboration between the State Library and the State Archives of North Carolina to educate our community about how each institution can help with your research topics while giving an overview of their institution's collections and services. Today's presentation will be recorded and made available online. Before I introduce our speakers, I would like to give you a quick overview of the Zoom platform. At the bottom of, our, of your screen, you will have access to a toolbar that will allow you to bring up the chat box by clicking on the associated button. Once done, you can chat with another participant directly or with everyone at this presentation. As we continue with the program, please use the chat box if you need technical help or to add questions that you would like to ask our presenters. Without further ado, please let me introduce you to your speakers. Kelly Agan is the Reference Services Supervisor at the State Library of North Carolina, Government and Heritage Library. She coordinates the library's public services and manages a group of dedicated and curious librarians who love helping people with North Carolina history research. She also coordinates library outreach and educational events like today's webinar. Kelly has a background in public history and education and she received her master's in library science from the University of North Carolina. She looks forward to meeting you and helping you in your research journey. Lauren Murphy is a reference archivist in the Public Services Unit of the State Archives of North Carolina, where she has worked since completing her master's degree from UNC Chapel Hill in 2018. Originally from Alabama, Lauren loves the way that working in public services challenges her to learn more about North Carolina's history, people, and places. Her own family began their American journey in colonial North Carolina, and she enjoys helping others find their own roots here in the records of North Carolina. Let's get this presentation started. Kelly, you now have the floor. Thank you, Francesca. Again, my name is Kelly Egan, and I am the Reference Services Supervisor here at the Government and Heritage Library. And as Francesca said, in that role, I manage our public services. And I'm going to give you a brief tour of our library's collections and services, how we can help you with your family history research, and how we can work with and complement the collections and services at the State Archives. Along the way, I'll also touch on some of the specialized items in our collection that can help you in your research journey. <clears throat> and the things that I'm sharing are some of the items that we talk about a lot when we help researchers. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and um, 
<clears throat> excuse me. So becoming acquainted with some of the terms that we use will help you in knowing where to start and whom to visit. And it will also help you if you reach out to us for more help or if you visit us in person. Depending on which state you might visit to do historical and family history research, the types of services and collections of state libraries, state archives, and in some cases, historical societies as well may be a bit different. Some states have one, others both, and some also have historical societies, all potentially contributing different aspects of collections and services to support the work of collecting records and providing access and research support um, to the public. So if you're looking for information and resources for other states, be sure to investigate all three of these when you're searching the internet. In North Carolina, we have both the State Library and State Archives, um, as you know from our talk today. We are both part of the North Carolina Department of Natural and Cultural Resources, and our offices are two floors apart at 109 East Jones Street in Raleigh. We each have separate and unique collections that complement each other, and together we can help you conduct your research, locate historical records, and piece together your ancestral or heritage story. So what does the State Library do that's a little bit different than the State Archives? First, the State Library of North Carolina is the principal library of North Carolina state government. And in that capacity, we serve the research needs of state government agencies and their employees for information and resources. The library is also the official repository of state government publications. And our collection of state government publications encompasses more than 100,000 items dating from the earliest publications of the General Assembly to um, contemporary times. And we have those publications both in print versions and now born digital, born digital versions. And here it's important um, to, to start out to distinguish the state, state government publications from the original records that state government agencies create doing their everyday work. <clears throat> Excuse me. Items we call publications include formats such as annual reports, pamphlets, books, and similar resources. The state library collects these publications where the state archives generally collects the original records. Along with supporting the operational needs of state government agencies at the Government and Heritage Library, the library preserves and facilitates access for the public as well to state government information. And part of our mission is also that we seek to advance the study, understanding, and appreciation of North Carolina's cultural heritage. In doing that, we also collect a wide range of historical resources and publications and we help an even wider range of researchers, including people doing family history research. Now, for some reason, oh, there we go. The slides weren't advancing for a second. Um, so for the next several minutes, oh, advanced too far, oh, pardon me. Sorry about that. We can always count on the obligatory technological glitches whenever we do a webinar. So for the next several minutes, I'm going to share what we do here at the State Library and information about those resources and services. As Francesca mentioned, we will provide links to resources in the chat. And following this webinar, we will send you an email with links to the resources and information we've mentioned today. So don't worry about scrambling to have to write everything down. We're gonna share a lot of information with you. So at the Government and Heritage Library, we call ourselves the GHL for short. We are your partner in North Carolina history and family history research. And again, where the State Archives collects original types of government records, such as wills, birth and marriage and death records, tax and property records, court records, and others, our collections help you locate the existence of those records and to find names and other information that exist in those original records so that then you can visit the state archives and find the original records there. The library also has many other historical publications and resources to help you learn about the history and provide historical context for your work and your story. But we'll get to that in a moment. Our librarians are the heart of what we do and they are very well versed in historical research methods, North Carolina history and the types of records and documents that you'll want to search for and find. 
We are also very well connected with other librarians and collections across the state of North Carolina. And it's important to note that there really is no single place to gather all the information needed for this type of research or for you to go to to answer all of your questions. So in working with the State Library, you have access to help through our wide network of knowledge and professional contacts. If we don't have something, we will help you figure out who does. And we very much enjoy doing that for you. If you are new to family history research, we can get you started with learning resources and tools that will help you understand the proper methods for genealogical work. And we can talk you through that process as well, whether in person, on the phone, in email, or even via our live chat reference service. And we'll get you well acquainted with the materials and resources that we have that are what we call the tools of the trade. If you're a seasoned researcher, we can help you strategize methods for getting through research roadblocks and dead ends and to help you chart new pathways for uncovering records, if they exist, of course. Um, the library also has a special book of librarian service. This service provides an extended and focused research consultation on a very specific topic that you need help with. If you feel this service would help you, please contact us to talk about setting up a consultation. We also provide in-depth research help in person, email and by email and on the telephone. There we go. Um, so to get started, I want to distinguish what we can do for you if you visit us in person versus what we can do for you um, over the internet or uh, by, by telephone and remotely. Um, visiting us on, on site allows you access, allows you the most access to our resources and our librarians. We provide one-on-one -on -one assistance when you visit us and we can help you strategize your project and help you, uh, uh, excuse me, um, uncover most efficiently the best approaches and resources for your question. We can schedule those book of library, excuse me, um, tripping over my own tongue today. We can schedule those book of librarian visits in person as well. And you also have full access to our print and online collections. The library also has state-of-the-art digital scanning equipment and microfilm readers for visitors to use. And we also provide self-service copying for a very modest fee. So in terms of what we can do for you remotely, while we do love to see you in person, there are also many ways that we can help you from afar. We answer lots of questions about the library's collection, and we also help people with many very, very specialized research problems. Our librarians help researchers find answers to many, many complex questions. And we do this every day of the week, and our librarians are very enthusiastic um, about these, the research problems that you bring to us. We can conduct the Book of Librarian appointments remotely as well, and we can also help you plan your visit to the library so that when you arrive to visit us in person, you come with a research plan. And although we can't conduct full-scale research for patrons, we can do some searching of our resources if we have specific details about what you're looking for. Um, for this, we often are asked to locate obituaries and articles in newspapers, information from county record abstracts, which I'll get to in a moment, and other information from the wide range of our materials. We're able to provide digital scans of items such as these for a small fee as well. So next, I want to talk briefly about some of the tools that we've made available to help you get started in your research. Whether you're just getting started or you need help with specific types of records or you're looking for research help on a specific topic, we've developed a number of online resources to help you. These are freely available and you can access them all from the library's website. All you need is an internet connection. Our research guides that we have made available online cover a wide variety of research and historical topics. These include history of North Carolina and the South, data and statistics, finding state government publications, classroom and curriculum support resources. And these research guides are really, um, I think of them as a very invaluable source of support for your research. They're designed to help you gather research methods and resources on a topic in one place, to help give you a comprehensive view of a topic and an easy way for you to find and access really pertinent resources to help you find the right resources. Our research guides include, uh, excuse me, include items from our print collections as well as targeted and relevant online resources. And we continue to develop these all the time. 
Again, you can access these right from our website. We've also created a number of tutorials for genealogy research. These include a free introductory course that you can access from our website. We also provide access to our SLNC Academy, which is a portal that's designed to give you free access to a range of educational tutorials on a wide range of library research and educational topics, including genealogy. Some of these tutorials have been created by our own librarians here at the library. Others come from libraries around the country. They are free and freely available. And again, all you need is an internet connection. And again, we'll provide you with links to all of these following the program. Finally, an essential part of conducting any research, including family history research, is developing a system for organizing and documenting your work. Our librarians can talk you through this process and we can connect you with forms and tools that you can use to document your work. Ensuring that you can retrace your research journey, know where you have and haven't looked, where records came from and how to find them again is an important part of conducting family history and other any other type of research. And we want to help you get the most from your research efforts. So we've made some of these tools and forms available online and our librarians can always help talk you through this process. Um, we are nuts about documentation and organizing things. So please come and ask us for help. And moving along with a slow internet connection. There we go. Um, so let's switch gears now for a few minutes. And I want to dig a little bit deeper into some of the specific resources that we have at the State Library. And as I run through these, and you keep them in mind, you can we'll tell to get a better understanding of how this library and the state are. So again, the library collects a wide variety of types of resources, resources to support your research. And out, whoops, pardon me, sorry about that, it'll come back. Um, so again, the first thing is that the State Library is the official repository for State of North Carolina government publications. And again, the State Library has more than 100,000 items that have been published by state agencies dating back to the, the, early, the early years of North Carolina. The collection includes compilation of laws enacted by the General Assembly, um, business conducted during its legislative sessions, the North, Car North Carolina General Statutes and other agency publications, such as from agencies like the Department of Agriculture, Health and Human Services, Department of Public Instruction, public safety, office of the courts, and many others. It is safe to say, I think, that there is no limit to the research value of this part of the collection. For family history research, people have located the names of ancestors, um, companies, and events who may have fear figured in their past. Um, sometimes they're looking for the name of an ancestor that may have been a legislator, a public servant, an educator, a justice of the peace, um, and, and many other reasons that we have sent people to state government publications in doing family history research. Um, recently, we helped a visitor to the library locate the names of Rosenwald schools in Lenore County around the turn of the 20th century so that he could try to locate family members who may have attended and learn more about the history of his family and community. In state government publications for the Department of Public Instruction, we were actually able to help him locate the names of all of these schools along with historical photographs that appeared in those state reports. Needless to say, he was thrilled that we were able to help him with this. Um, and this uh, information has also helped provide him with specifics that he can take for his next steps, which will be to visit the state archives to see what records might still exist at the Department of Public Instruction to see if he can learn more about any information about his family that might be in those records. The State Library also holds a very comprehensive collection of North Carolina new newspapers from communities across the state. And this collection goes back to the state's earliest papers from the 18th century. This collection is on microfilm and the library has two state-of-the-art digital microfilm readers, as I mentioned that are available for use in the reading room. We also lend out our microfilm to other libraries via interlibrary loan. And newspaper microfilm is really a vital source of information for historical events and photographs, marriage and death notices, and local community news. So that's a vital, a vital resource in doing family history research. 
Next, we have a broad range of historical publications and scholarly works related to North Carolina and the history of the South. The research value of this collection is immense. It helps provide a window into the history that gives meaning to your family heritage. And it also provides us with valuable resources for us to locate citations and footnotes that we can use to help you locate other resources and historical record collections that may help you. We also have a large collection of historical and current periodicals, including Our State Magazine, North Carolina's um, sort of premier historical travel and tourism magazine dating back to the 1930s. And this magazine provides a window into local history, local color, and researchers have used it in many ways to find mention of events, people and places, along with advertisements and other information that may be relevant to their story. We have a large collection of lineage society publications, both for North Carolina related genealogical societies, as well as from other states that figure in historical immigration and migration patterns into and out of North Carolina. The library also has a collection of historical city and county directories. And these are another invaluable key resource for family history research research, excuse me. Researchers can locate names, addresses, and even occupations. Um, a fabulous, fabulous resource to mine. Next, we have publications of abstracts and indexes of North Carolina County government records. This is an important type of resource to remember, and I'm going to cover it in more depth in just a second. The library also collects family histories. These are self-published books that detail the history and documentary record of a given family. The library also has numerous historical maps to support connecting history and heritage with the land, gazetteers to help find towns and historical places, military pension records, census records, and many more types of information and publications. We also have a wide range of online resources that I'll get to toward the end of my portion. So one of the great benefits of our collection is that it is intensely local. And as I talk for the next couple of minutes, you'll realize what I mean about that. And for this, let's get started with those abstracts and indexes of government records that I mentioned a few minutes ago. Government, in my opinion, is a great compiler and preserver of records. In doing family history research, people look for records that those records to provide proof of the existence of and activities of their ancestors. These types of records include tax records, property records, court records, birth, marriage, and death, records of orphans, children born out of wedlock, and apprenticeship along with wills and estates. While these records do provide that quote proof of existence and location, they are found among literally thousands of records held by the state archives. For North Carolina, records are organized by county, and we have 100 of them. And what we call abstracts and indexes provide an essential means for locating names and existence of records. Once you have references to those records, then you can visit the state archives to more easily access them. The library has several thousand publications of abstracted and indexed county records that we use to help people get their quote in to the record at the state archives. This slide shows some examples, just a few examples from our print collection. And one thing to note about that is you'll see that they all look very different and they are all very different. No two of them are exactly alike because they were done by individual researchers and these works are largely also self-published. Um, but they represent hours and hours of work done by researchers who have gone through records at the state archives to index and abstract them to, to essentially provide this in to the record. So I want to for a second take a, a very quick look at really a little bit deeper about what we mean by abstracts and indexes, because these are terms that our librarians use all the time when people contact us and people visit us. And I think there is a certain amount of mystery surrounding them. So I want to just take a deeper look. So just to show you sort of what, what they really mean and how you can use them. The image on the left shows an index of marriage records from Caswell County, North Carolina from the 18th and 19th century. And like an index that you've seen in the back of a book, this index is very brief. It is a list by name of the most important and basic details of a marriage record, i.e. the groom, the bride, and a date. 
On the other hand, to show you what an abstract is, an abstract is a little bit more involved um, extraction of the record. And so the image on the left shows an abstract. And in this case, it's an abstract of deeds. And this, um, this shows basic information like an index, but with more details. Typically, an abstract takes a small portion of the actual text of the record, in this case, the deed that would be helpful for a researcher. It might, and an abstracted record might include, for example, for deed transfers, um, the names of the parties to the deed, names of additional parties that were mentioned, the number of acres, the amount paid. And then these records will also give you the location of the record in the state archives so that you can visit them and very easily ask them to help you locate that record. In addition to abstracts and indexes of records for North Carolina counties, the state library also collects these types of compilations for other states that figured prominently in the history and immigration history of immigration into and again migration out of North Carolina. And these include Maryland, Virginia, South Carolina, Georgia, other th southern states and um, Tennessee and others as well. And again, these, these publications are self-published by historical researchers. And the collection that we have is really one of a kind because they really are available only in print. So it is a very unique and special part of our collection that we make available. So there are other abstracts and indexes, not just of um, county government information. And they're really created for a wide range of record types. And the library also has numerous publications for these as well. We have indexes and abstracts, for example, for census records, church records and histories, lineage, lineage society records, abstracts of newspaper information, such as marriage and death notices, indexes and abstracts of road records, um, railroad records, cemetery records, architectural surveys and landscape features such as mills and grist mills, places, other places, and there are many other types of abstracts and indexes. These are just a few that, that I was able to sort of highlight for you today. And researchers rely heavily on these to expand their research, locate people in places, and, and go ahead and build their heritage story. <laughs> So again, um, I'm going to point out how very, very local our collection is for you. What this means is that researchers can use our resources to dig down to the local community level. This might include looking at historical publications related to immigrant and cultural communities, church histories, and I've shown a few of those on the bottom part of this slide, business histories, educational and school histories, and others. In addition, we have a very large collection of historical publications, which we organize by region and county that are related to counties, towns, and their cultural and social history. These are also highly valuable resources, and they're often used by people to locate the names of ancestors, buildings, events, historical images, and to learn about the social history of place in the particular era that they're researching. And again, for the most part, these resources are only available in print and not available online due to copyright. And we have collected and preserved them for you in our collection. I have a very slow internet connection today. There we go. Okay, so I am getting close to the end of my portion. Um, I just have a couple of slides left. So I want to talk for a second about family histories. And the library, as I mentioned, has collected several thousands of these family histories. They are typically, again, self-published works by researchers who have completed extensive genealogical work. No two are the same, but with, they all have numerous references to the original records found to document a family. And they often help researchers solve roadblocks, make their own connections, connect with their community heritage, and get ideas for telling their own stories. The image on the right of this slide um, shows a few of the family histories that we have at the library. And the larger image on the left is a family history that was recently completed and donated to the library by a researcher who has visited us numerous times to research his family's Warren County heritage. We were thrilled, we were thrilled to have him share this with us. Very slow internet connection. 
So um, getting to the end, um, I'm gonna talk for just a couple minutes about our online resources. So we've talked about the types of resources the library has in print, and I'm just gonna share a couple of the, the main details of our online collections. First, the GHL library catalog is available online. If you are planning to visit us in person, please feel free to search the catalog ahead of time to locate materials that you might wanna look at. This can help make your time much more effective when you visit us. But if you're just getting started, no worries at all. We will be glad to help you when you arrive. Again, and then next, North Carolina has its own online encyclopedia. It's called ncpedia.org and it is coordinated and managed here at the Government and Heritage Library. This resource contains more than 8,000 articles on a wide range of North Carolina historical topics, along with access to digitized historical and primary source collections. It, it has been used by many researchers to learn more about North Carolina history. And some have even used it to find rele information relevant to their own family history and their community heritage. And again, this resource is freely available online, no login required. And the State Library, in partnership with the State Archives, also has a large collection of digitized materials. For the State Library, many of these include state publications like the Department of Public Instruction reports I mentioned earlier that a recent researcher found so helpful. It also includes a collection of North Carolina newspapers from the 18th and 19th century. We also have, um, oh, it also includes architectural reports for historical buildings and towns, soldier pension applications, wills from 1663 to 1789, which I'm sure Lauren might mention, tax lists from the colonial and revolutionary era, veterans oral histories, and many, many other types of collections. I encourage you to, to visit it and enjoy getting lost in the collection. The State Library also provides access to database collections, some freely available, and others available through the State Library subscriptions. Some collections are available with a State Library card and um, others are freely available. Please visit our website. Um, we'll give you the links again for those um, to learn more about these services. And these collections include access to resources for Ameri African-American history, more digitized North Carolina city directories, historical maps, North Carolina newspapers, historical and contemporary genealogy information and databases such as Ancestry and Fold 3, geographic information and maps, resources for data and business and science, and really numerous reference resources and collections for locating historical and primary source materials. So again, feel free to get lost in our website as well. So just to take a second to put it all together. So Visiting the library in person again allows you the most access, but if, but if that is not possible, as we know for many people, we can provide assistance remotely. We can help locate resources on microfilm and newspapers. Again, people also often ask us for help load, locating obituaries and events from newspapers. The library does charge a modest fee for this, and we need some special details from you. Um, we also help people with a wide range of historical questions and all questions are interesting. Please bring them to us and we will do our best to help you. Again, we have very dedicated and curious librarians who are eager to work with you and help you with your questions. Um, we have one librarian who is currently helping a patron locate the name of the Justice of Peace who married his parents in Watauga County in the North Carolina mountains many, many years ago. And that is a fascinating, wonderful historical question. And we are honored that people bring these questions to us. And so um, in conclusion, please connect with us, share your questions, let us try to help. The library is open Monday to Friday from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. And beginning November 13th, we will be open on Saturdays from nine to one. Connect with us in person again by phone, email, and our live chat service. And you can find all this in the links that we'll send you. Visit our website to learn more about educational events and happenings like today's webinar, and then please connect with us with social media, by social media. We share lots of historical information and research tips. And if you're a North Carolina resident, please ask us about getting that important GHL library card. And thank you very much um, for letting me speak to you today. And I'm going to turn it over to Lauren. Thank you, Kelly. Let's just get that uh, remote control fixed. 
All right. So, um, yes, my name is Lauren Murphy. I'm a public services archivist, correspondence archivist, reference archivist. I'm not really sure exactly what my job title is, but I work in public services at the State Archives. Um, and I'm going to give you a brief overview today of what the State Archives in North Carolina has to offer genealogists and family historians. Um, and Kelly's done such a good job uh, already kind of talking about how the library and the archives work together. And so I'll just kind of pick up with talking specifically about some of the resources that the State Archives can offer. So we'll talk about the collection scope. Uh, obviously, we, we have over 100 million records. We have an incredibly huge range of collections, but not all of them are particularly useful for family history. So I'll just highlight some that are particularly helpful. I'll talk a little bit about the search room, what to expect when you're visiting, go over our on-site and remote research services, and briefly touch on some digital resources that you might find helpful at home. So first, there are four main categories of records that contain materials relevant to family history and are particularly useful for family history. County, state agency, private, and military collections. And I'll apologize now in advance for my dog. Um, first, county records. County records are records that were either created by the county directly or whose existence is due to requirements set by the county. For example, court records which are directly created by the county. Wills and marriage records and exist in certain different time periods because of requirements about settling estates and just making that easier for inheritances to be divided up. If you're trying to connect the lines on your family tree, county records will probably be the most helpful for you. Wills and estate files can provide approximate dates of death, connect parents to children, and also provide the names of slaves. Land records can, aside from giving you location information about which county your ancestors lived in or who maybe who they lived around, um, it can also be a source of relationship information. Occasionally, individuals would give their property away as a deed of gift to their children, and rather than leaving a very specific will about how their estate was to be divided up. Marriage records are helpful, but can be tricky. Um, this is something that, that is often a surprise to people, but the earliest marriage records, those prior to 1868, do not contain parental information most of the time. They're called marriage bonds. And the most information they really provide is an approximate date of marriage in the spouse's name. But after 1868, you have two main types of records, marriage registers and marriage licenses or certificates. These we mostly have on microfilm and we're more likely to have the marriage register for the county than the actual marriage certificates. And this is where it's a little tricky because marriage registers are not all created equal. Some of them record parental information depending on the county, others do not. And so what you're going to be able to find, which if you have a marriage certificate can be a huge wealth of information about where each individual was born, who married them, who their parents were, um, whether their parents were living or dead at the time of the marriage is just going to be dependent on what county it is. Um, and finally, court records are extensive. That's, that takes up a bulk of the county records are those court minutes, civil action, criminal action files, various dockets, um, and those court records can provide you with a wealth of information if you're willing to go digging. Um, and this is where those county abstracts in the state library can be really helpful because a lot of those really early court records are very difficult to read. Um, but things like administration hearings, bastardy proceedings, juror lists, road overseer lists, military service, civil and criminal act cases and action files, all can provide information about your family history. And whether it's connecting family lines or just kind of providing a sense of what your ancestor did in the county. Um, if they served on the jury often, if they were a road overseer and assigned to that job more than once, um, that kind of civil service that a lot of genealogical societies are looking for. Now second, state agency records can be really helpful. 
just make sure you're giving us enough time to move. There we go. Okay. Um, the majority of our state agency records are unprocessed materials from the 20th century. Um, if you've ever visited the state archives, you know, the building kind of next to us that's right across the street from the governor's mansion is the state record center. And that building holds I mean, just thousands of um, unprocessed 20th century and earlier and 21st century state agency records. Um, however, there are several record groups from early agencies that contain useful information. The Secretary of State materials include land grants, wills, estates, and tax lists. Tax, tax lists can be useful for family history, whether to confirm when someone was in a particular area in a particular year, or potentially, depending on the tax list, to connect them to another family member. The Treasurer and Comptroller records, that's kind of the early state treasurer record group, those contain records of payments from the Revolutionary War and the War of 1812 that can help you provide some kind of service, whether it's actually carried a gun, fought in battles, military service, or provided materials for a soldier who's passing by, provided a place for an officer to stay, that kind of, again, kind of a civil slash military service that you see a lot during the Revolutionary Wars, especially. Um, the General Assembly records are maybe not one that people often think of when they're thinking of doing their family history, but personally, I adore the General Assembly records. I think that they are fascinating and just contain so much interesting material, including material related to family trees and family histories. Um, there you'll find petitions for manu manumission, emancipation, divorce petitions, child custody, name changes, petitions for pensions and military service. Um, so it's not the kind of thing where, you know, necessarily you go, okay, okay, I can't find this person after this date. Maybe they change their name. Well, occasionally, um, but it, it's still, it's a good place to check and look and kind of dig around a little bit. And actually what makes those easy to dig around in is that all those records prior to 1816 are available in the digital collections. Um, and of course, things like divorce and child custody that we now think of as being county level records early in the 19th century and um, in part of the, parts of the 18th actually took place at the general assembly level. Um, finally, the Supreme Court, uh, those are definitely a series that people often don't think of for family history. So I wanna just briefly touch on it. Sometimes contested wills and estates will make it all the way to the Supreme Court. And what happens with Supreme Court cases is that the county mm -hmm. sends everything that they have related to the case to the Supreme Court, and then it stays there. So there have been a couple instances when I've been doing research for people remotely and found, oh, their will is actually in the Supreme Court file. There's nothing left at the county level because the county sent it all the way to the Supreme Court. So again, rare, not a given or at all, but a good place to check if you're having trouble in other locations. And finally, for the collection scope, let's compare private and military collections. So private, both of these collections are mainly made up of materials that have been donated to us, um, whether it's by family members or organizations. Um, in the private collections, you might, might be able to find a, a collection that was donated by distant relations that helps you connect some dots or learn a little bit more about your family history. Um, but we also have a couple of larger collections that were donated to us by genealogists and historians that contain the research that they did. Um, sometimes it's for books that never got published. Other times it's for books that it would be a lot easier if you went downstairs and found the book in the library than going through kind of their pages and pages of notes, but um, it can still be a helpful resource if you happen to be researching a family that they also did as well. Um, so again, that's not going to apply to most people, but it's worth a look. Um, the military collections 
do not contain service records as we would think of them. Um, that's normally a federal record. However, we do have militia lists and bounty payrolls for the War of 1812 and the Civil War, and then extensive collections related to the Civil War, World War I and World War II, mainly um, thinking of correspondence, materials donated to us by family members or by service members. Um, some really fascinating materials there that have been extensively described in finding aids that I'll touch on in just a, just a few minutes. Um, so that's kind of the scope. Now, visiting the search room. Check our website before coming, not Google. Google has not been right about our hours since the beginning of the pandemic. Tried to get it changed, hasn't really happened. Um, you will need a photo ID to enter the building and to sign into the archives. Um, there's parking available across the street and some on the street. At the moment, and this is why I say check our website before coming, is we're currently open from nine to five, Monday through Friday. That was a recent change of ex extending our hours. Um, but in a couple weeks, I believe on November 8th, we will be switching kind of back to our old schedule, which was to be closed on Mondays and open on Saturdays. So we'll be open nine to five, Tuesday through Friday and nine to one on Saturday. It's important to know that there are a lot of restrictions on what you can actually bring into the archives. This is in order to preserve, you know, our mission is to preserve and protect those records so that they can be available for you and other researchers. And so part of that is not allowing anything to come in that records could be slipped into or that could damage records such as pens or drinks. Um, Cameras and laptops are welcome, just no flash. And all of these rules will be explained to you when you visit, you'll be given a rule sheet to kind of look over. Um, of course, there's a, a lot of grace and a lot of just us uh, helping you make the most of your visit. Um, now, when you visit, um, there's quite a few on-site services you can take advantage of. Um, we are happy to provide research assistance as in depth as we are able to, but that's a, kind of limited by staff availability and the number of patrons present, um, just as to how one-on-one -on -one that could be. Um, but we are so happy to look into anything, any questions you may have, answer them to the best of our ability, or as Kelly said, point you in the direction of someone or something that we think will be able to address the question better. Um, whether that's another institution or a particular book. Um, we are very happy to assist you in kind of sculpting your research as you visit the archives. We have a pretty large open microfilm room. There's a picture of it right there. Um, you can print for 25 cents a page. So bring your quarters or we can make change for you. Um, there, the bulk of, of that room is county records. Um, a lot of them that we don't necessarily have the originals for like marriage registers, deeds, um, and then also materials that have been pulled for preservation, land grants, Revolutionary War Army accounts, and um, newspapers. We also have copying services. You cannot make your own copies on site, but we can make copies of original records for you. We'll make up to about 100 copies a day per person and it's a 10 cents per page um, charge, but uh, we are very happy to do that. And also if you happy to point you to a place online that the material might be as well. Um, like the State Library, we also have remote services. We are happy to answer general questions and give kind of a research consultation via email or phone. Our email is just archives at ncdcr.gov. And you can also um, leave at the end, there'll be a link to kind of our contact page where you can submit a request. We are happy to search for and provide copies of specific records. Like, like Kelly also said, we, we need specific information for this, but we're also happy to kind of take what you have and then tell you what we still need and where you might be able to find that information in secondary sources. Um, and you can see uh, our store. You can place orders online. I'll show you that store in just a minute. Um, we're also happy to assist you in planning and prioritizing your trip to the archives. If you send us an email and like, these are the things that I'm looking for and we can tell you, okay, well, these are online. Here's some links to where you might be able to look at them, but then these we maybe we'd be happy to pull for you and have ready. Um, 
just depending on kind of what your time frame is and what you're looking at and kind of the bulk of the collection uh, or bulk of what you're looking for. Most of the records you would use for family history, um, we can get in five to 10 minutes for you when you visit the archives. So we don't pull a lot beforehand, but we're happy to talk to you about that. Um, this is the landing page for our store. You can place orders online here. There is a fee upfront for out-of-state residents, um, but this is also a good place to just kind of look at what we can search for and what we need to know in order to search for it. Can just kind of give you a helpful way to organize how you're going, what you're going to be looking for next. Um, Finally, I'll just touch on some digital resources, um, finding aids, our catalog, and the digital collections, which uh, Kelly gave a great overview of. So I'll probably, um, I'll touch on a couple other things that we have. Um, so people sometimes have trouble using our website. I'm terribly sorry about that. So I'm going to give you a little, just this is where you find these things. So. Um, you'll find our finding aids and box lists under the researchers tab. Um, you can click on researchers and then finding aids. This is also where you'll find a lot of other helpful information. Over on the left services is where you'll find information about our remote services and um, what we can do for you there. Collections will give you a little overview of different collections that we have course, frequently asked questions. Um, transcribe and see if you want to get a little deeper and in, in real up close and personal with the records, you can uh, sign up and volunteer to help us transcribe records. Um, but we'll go on finding aids. Now, um, I don't know if that worked. Sorry, uh, finding aids. A finding aid is a document that gives a more lengthy description. Um, there we go. Of a collection than the entry you'd find in the catalog. Um, they often have box or even folder lists so that you know exactly what boxes you need to pull when you visit. Not everything, in fact, very few things are actually indexed by name or indexed very specifically in our online catalog. And we'll talk more about that in a moment, but box lists can be a helpful way to um, supplement the catalog by coming and clicking on this county records box list. There's also links to military collection finding aids, governor's papers, and more there as well. But um, county record box list will list, say, for example, um, all of the estates for a county or the coroner's inquests for a county, um, giving index of civil actions. Now, I say for a county, not all counties have box lists for everything. Some counties don't have, we don't have any boxes for it. It really depends on kind of what's been done recently. Um, what we do have is for every county is a miscellaneous records finding aid that goes folder by folder telling you what you can expect to find in the miscellaneous records. Um, but it can be a good place to check before you come to see if we have, say, an estate file, um, that way you don't maybe make an unnecessary trip. And if, um, of course, we're hopefully would be adding more as time goes as time goes on. We'll be adding more to that. Um, but that's a great place to get some more information about our resources. Um, now, the online catalog. We go back to the home screen and then search catalog at the top right. Now this will take you to a landing page that has links to frequently asked questions, um, links to instructional information, uh, manuals, things that we are hopefully going to be adding a lot to in the next year or so, just so you know. Um, and we'll just click search the catalog just to give you a quick look at it. Um, if you're used to Mars, this may be a little bit of a shock, but it, we have had this catalog now for two years. Um, and we're here to help you figure out how to use it, especially me. I'm kind of the um, point person for that. So if you have questions, please, please, please just send me an email. I'd be happy to, to talk you through an email if I can or give you a call and walk you through it. Um, but the most important thing to be aware of when searching doc, as I said earlier, is that very few records are actually indexed by name. It can be a great way to browse and see what types of records we have, 
Um, one of the best things to do was to learn how to look at the county records to see what specifically we have for that county for specific years. It's kind of like, it's like looking at the card catalog, except it's more extensive than the card catalog is and it's on, on, your, on your computer at home. Um, and I would be happy to walk anyone through that. Um, but like I said, most records are only described at a very high level. Um, but these specific records are indexed by name, land grants, wills, but only wills prior to 1900, Revolutionary War arm counts, cohabitation bonds, Confederate pension applications, which are also available in our digital collections for free that you can download, color scans, and district superior court estate files. Now, finally, the digital collections, if you go back to that researchers tab and click on digital collections. Um, you'll find links not only to NCDC, the joint venture between the state library and state archives, but also to our Flickr account where we have hundreds of images digitized and that's being added to all the time. Um, North Carolina maps, another joint project bringing you maps from repositories across the state. And then finally digital collections. Some of the main materials that are really helpful for Family history there are your War of 1812 pay vouchers, troop returns, Confederate pension applications, Secretary of State wills, those General Assembly session records I mentioned, and um, lots more. There's it's a it's a pretty exciting exciting place and a good place to start out when you're looking um, just to kind of get a, get a taste for what we have at the State Archives. So um, with that, I will hand it back over uh, Kelly. Francesca, are we ready for some Q&A? Yes, thank you. Um, I just wanna say thank you so much, Kelly and Lauren, for giving us an overview of the collections and services at the State Library and the State Archives of North Carolina. As we begin the Q&A section of our program, we encourage you to please post any questions you have for the presenters in the chat box. So a question that we had, um, which it looks like Doug just answered it, is about the county records boxes and said when she says the county box list shows state records, does she mean that it shows whether or not the county has a state record or does it show which estates are in a particular county? Yeah, the latter is going to be the answer there. It'll show which estates we have a, a list of names, alphabetical order for a particular county. Um, I, I think I want to say there's maybe 30 counties about that have those. Um, so another question that we had from the audience is what what state archives records are available on ancestry.com or familysearch.com or .org? So this is an interesting question that for family search at least definitely depends on the county. Um, but family search has digitized a lot of our county microfilm. So court records, wills, estate records, marriage registers, that kind of thing. Um, Ancestry.com has our marriage records and the index to marriage bonds, death certificates, and um, our, our land grants are some of the primary records that are available on Ancestry. So we just had two questions come in and one was if we could show the slide again on the materials index by name. Absolutely. So I will do that right. There, just put that slide up. And we had a question from Robert. If a county doesn't show under a category, does that mean you would have to go to that specific county to find those records because they haven't turned them in over to the state? So no. Um, if you're talking about the box list, the, fi the finding aids I showed, those are really only done for a few counties. They are not an extensive description of what we have for each county. That's the catalog. Um, for this, I would send us an email. 
If you are looking for something in the catalog and you can't find that we have, say, marriage certificates for Chatham County between you know 1875 to 1915 or something, say something that specific, um, send us an email. Sometimes it'll be because of the date. Sometimes it will be because of a burn county. Um, if it's prior to about 1950, really 1970, we should have the records. Um, but it does depend a lot on the county. And so the best thing to do is just to, con to contact us and we, will, and we will look into it for you and let you know if, it's, um, if you do need to contact the county. We're getting close to the end of our presentation. Are there any other questions that y'all have you would like to ask Lauren or Kelly? So the question was, who thought replacing Mars with the current website was a good idea? Um, well, uh, one of the reasons for that is that we, so Mars was built in a house quite a while ago and had really, um, was not built for current technology and servers. And um, Francesca knows about this from her time at the State Archives. Um, but uh, um, so replacing Mars with Doc was part of what happened when we transferred our, um, bibliographic record keeping services over to a different um, a different vendor, um, something that was not built in house and has um, a lot more support. Um, yeah, it is a process for sure. Um, I can tell you that there are actually more records that are available to find in Doc than there were in Mars. Um, and that uh, um, it is something that I am very, very happy to explain how to search in there. I've, we've been wanting to do a series of videos explaining how to do, how to use the catalog. Those haven't happened yet, but hopefully they will be happening in the next year. So. Thanks, Lauren. Kelly. Yeah, actually, I wanted to circle back on the ancestry question and the digitization of records because, Lauren, we get this question actually a lot. And we're never 100% sure how to answer it when people ask, you know, of the record types that have been digitized for North Carolina and are in Ancestry, is that all of what the State Archives holds for those? Or is that project not complete? So, we get this question a lot, so. Not necessarily. Um, what Ancestry and Family Search mainly did was basically, as far as I'm aware, Doug, please come in and correct me if I'm wrong, is they purchased our microfilm and digitized it. So if we have, and there are some instances where say we've received a couple new marriage registers or more deeds um, from the county, we have the microfilm now, but Ancestry and Family Search haven't followed up to buy the rest of the film and digitize it. Um, so it is not necessarily, unfortunately, it's a very good place to start, um, but it is, yeah, it's always worth reaching out to see if we have more. Okay, great, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> so we have a couple of suggestions. Um, maybe we can have like a video for help navigating the website. I think we're talking about the State Archives and we have that might be for this to that, but I do know that the State Library has a lot of tutorials to help with using a lot of our search um, engines and databases and catalogs. So please check that out. Kelly talked about that in Niche Academy. And then are there videos to watch about best practices, best practices research on digital and C? So Digital NC is um, not our website. Kelly, so I'm thinking for this question, are there any best practices on research for researching like North Carolina history? It's digital, when I think of Digital NC, I think of the website 
uh, so North Carolina Heritage Center, something like that. Right. Yeah, so Digital NC um, is actually a super valuable resource for anybody doing um, family history research. And it can be accessed um, from the State Library's website in our online collections um, page that, again, we'll share all that with you if you, you know, so you don't have to worry about getting those URLs right now. So that project is really, again, when I say North Carolina, that, you know, getting to the local in doing your research. And so um, Digital NC is a project, a collaborative project of many partners across the state that essentially has digitized history at the local and county level. And it inc includes local newspapers, um, North, some of North Carolina's African-American newspapers, yearbook project, memorabilia, city directories, more city directories, audiovisual material. It's a fabulous resource for really digging into local history and, and looking for names and events. And so, so that's what Digital NC is. And then in terms of best practices, I mean, I think that, um, you know, there are research methods and that's one thing that we can help talk you through at the State Library and on our page that is the Getting Started page. We put some information about that there. Um, and if you are getting started, we have those videos, we have our short online genealogy course that can help you. And as I was saying in my portion, one of the most important things that you can do for a research method is to document what you've done. That is probably the single most important thing that you can do as a research method because, because that makes your work reproducible. Um, for yourself and others. And, and so I think that just, you know, talking about research methods, that is for me the, the single most important thing that I would encourage anyone to do. And we can help you with tools for that to help, you know, if you need help documenting and getting started with that. Um, you know, and then if there are other aspects of research, um, you know, kind of specialized, specialized topics or looking at specialized collections, we can help, you know, we can help talk you through that as well. And, and um, you know, share how we would go about doing those special things. So I would say that some of it is dependent upon the type of collection and the type of record you're looking for, but the documentation piece is is stands for everything. So, Kelly, you're so right. I've heard so many times where people are looking at the same types of records over and over again because they haven't documented that they looked at that county already for a particular will. So documenting is so important. Highly suggest it. Again, Kelly was saying we have a lot of materials that can help or research materials that can help you and resources for that part of your research. So I don't see any other questions and it looks like we're about out of time. Um, Lauren, Kelly, do you have anything else that you would like to say before um, I conclude the event? I would just say, don't be a stranger. Contact us, visit us. Um, we would love to work with you. And um, that's what we do. And that's what we love. So please, please connect. <clears throat> and thank you for joining us today. Great, right. thank you. Thank you, Kelly and Lauren. And thank you to the audience for attending this Family History Starts Here presentation. We would really appreciate you taking the time to fill out our event survey to give us feedback on this program. You will find the survey link in the chat box. Our next SLNC Government and Heritage Library program, Peace Valor and Victory, Finding and Remembering North Carolina Veterans, the full three will be on Wednesday, November 10th at 10 a.m. Please use the link in the chat to register. As we adjourn, please let's give a virtual round of applause to our speakers, Kelly and Lauren, as well as our chat tech support, Victoria and Doug. We would also like to thank Carolina Captioning for being our live captioner today. Thanks again for joining us, and we look forward to seeing you at other GHL events. <laughs>